Hi, welcome back to the last chapter of class 11 geography. Today's lesson is about natural hazards and disasters. But before we start, I would like to quickly say thanks for the great feedbacks. I'm really humbled to know that these videos do help in some way because good amount of time goes into making them. So once again, thank you guys for watching. Alrighty, with no further ado, let's begin. So what is change? Change is such a strong word that it can change our world in terms of social, economic, cultural and climatic ways. It's a non-stop process. No one can stop it. Big things, small things, material, non-material, everything goes through physical and chemical changes. Now change have different meanings for different people. From nature's perspective, change can be neither good nor bad. But from human point of view, it's always value related. For example, change of seasons. It is good for growing fruits and crops. Businesses rely on it. While there are other changes like earthquakes for new land formation, floods for soil transportation and wars for safeguarding nation's economic interest. These are considered bad and undesirable. So now you know the essence of what we are going to study in this chapter. Hazards and disasters are the consequences of both natural forces and human activities. Let's broadly understand the differences between natural hazards and natural disasters. In both the cases, there is always a threat to life, health, environment and property. Natural hazards have the potential to cause harm to people or property or sometimes both. Understand the segmentation over here. During a gas leak or an explosion, it can affect both property as well as human. Sometimes if there are no human there, it's just the property that is affected. On the other hand, natural disasters are larger in magnitude. The destruction and damages caused by it are very high. I mean, if there is a huge crack due to earthquake, it will not spare any particular institution or place or human settlement. It would just go and destroy everything that comes in its way. Natural hazards can be same and we can learn from it. Let's take an example of a gas leak. If there was a gas leak last year, we can control it by implementing a particular system or procedure to stop it so that it doesn't occur next time. On the other hand, no two disasters are similar and comparable to each other. Hence, pre-planning may not work. For example, in the case of an earthquake, if an earthquake comes, we can think about making houses stronger or move to a particular place where earthquake doesn't happen. So by doing all of this, we still cannot guarantee that the earthquake would not happen again and we cannot even measure the destruction caused by it. Humans are too small in front of nature in this case. Some of the types of hazards are physical, chemical, biological. In physical category, an explosion can cause huge amount of heat and that can lead to extreme damages. Now in terms of chemical hazards, they are mostly due to leakages. For example, a gas leak or an acid leak which can cause tremendous amount of destruction. And the third type is the biological hazard. They are purely related to viruses, bacterial and radiation. If there is an outbreak of a flu in a city, it falls under biological hazard. And similarly, if there is a nuclear hazard, the radiation caused by it falls under biological hazard. And on the other hand, the types of natural disaster one can witness is in the form of earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, wildfire, landslides, droughts and volcanic eruptions. Their consequences are massive. So here are the top 12 natural disasters since 1948. You don't have to remember everything, just go through the ones with the red dot next to it. So now we'll try to understand the classification of natural disasters. The first one is the atmospheric disasters. You see all the names under it, blizzards, thunderstorm, lightning, tornadoes, all of this are caused in the atmosphere. So atmosphere is nothing but below the sky and above the ground. So remember it this way. The second one is the terrestrial types. The easy way to remember this is just remember God. All the things that fall under this category are done by God and there is no control whatsoever. And the third type is the aquatic. By the name itself you can figure out related to water. So the disasters caused by floods, tidal waves, currents, storm, everything falls under aquatic types. And the last one is of biological types. So any kind of epidemic, flu or anything of medical sort which is spread in a place falls under biological category of disasters. So there was a recent outbreak of swine flu in our country, H1N1 virus. So that falls under biological disaster because it's causing a lot of harm. People are dying actually because of that. So remember it that way. I hope everything is clear now. So let's just go through everything again all together. So four types of categories are atmospheric. So the meaning of atmosphere is above the land and below the sky. The second one is terrestrial. So by terrestrial, just remember of God. Yeah, everything that is done by God, which are not under human control, falls under terrestrial. Third type of disaster is the aquatic. Anything that, that is related to the water part. 
okay and the fourth path is biological everything related to disease bacteria viruses which we cannot see yet it creates a lot of problem so this is the classification of natural disasters so now let's try to understand the natural disasters that hits the subcontinent of india the first phenomena is the earthquakes they are by far the most unpredictable and highly destructive of all and their area of influence is also quite large Earthquakes occur due to the sudden release of energy during the tectonic activities in the earth's crust. The surface of the earth is divided into multiple plates. They are called tectonic plates. The formation of different continents is the direct resultant of plates being moving from here and there. So when two plates collide or come in contact, they release tremendous amount of energy. Hence earthquake is a resultant of that kind of activity. So some of the most vulnerable states in India are Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttaranchal, Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal and all the seven states of the northeast Maharashtra and Gujarat cracks are formed on the surface it is natural when there is earthquake you will see massive cracks when there is a crack massive water or volatile material will gush out there are places through which molten lava or hot spring that is boiling water comes out huge quantity of steam air comes out from the surface earthquakes are the prime reason landslide occurs and due to landslide Rivers often change their course and when a river changes its course floods will occur and that will bring other kind of calamities so you see the chain reaction how things are connected after making intensive analysis some of our government agencies like national geophysical laboratory geological survey of india department of meteorology and the recently formed national institute of disaster management they have collectively come to a decision wherein they will divide india into following five earthquake zones and they are very high damage risk zone high damage risk zone moderate damage risk zone low damage risk zone and very low damage risk zone so out of these the first two zones have experienced some of the most devastating earthquakes in india you can look at the major earthquake hazard zones in india in this map I'll just focus on the very high damage risk zone and that is the region highlighted in yellow color in this map. So this entire portion which is also called the Himalayan range was not there initially. So this was formed as a result of a tectonic activity. When the remaining peninsula plateau collided with the above Asian plate, there was a huge land collision. Because of that, Himalayas emerged. So naturally, it has to be a very high risk zone and it is also said that we are constantly being pushed towards the north side. As a result, Himalaya is rising day by day. Moving on to the next phenomena, it's the tsunami. Tsunamis are nothing but high vertical waves. Now these waves need to move in order to cause a problem. So what makes these waves move? Earthquakes and volcanic eruptions cause the sea floor to move, resulting in sudden displacement of ocean water in the form of high vertical waves. In 1915, there was a German geologist uh, named Alfred Wegener. So this guy proposed the theory of continental drift, which states that parts of the earth's crust slowly drift on top of a liquid core. So you know what it means? It means that the continent are floating on top of a water body and hence the water beneath that is making it move and later on another american geologist by the name of harry hess he discovered that in the deep ocean floor there were huge trenches and cracks he then proposed the theory of sea floor spreading which is also called plate tectonics what he meant was the continents are on top of a sea floor and the sea floor itself is separating and moving so just try to understand this if the ocean bed is expanding automatically on top the continents would move apart then this theory was widely accepted that's why we no more say it as continental drift we call it as plate tectonics anyways whenever this ocean bed would stretch and deep cracks would have formed from their volcanic eruption the molten magma comes out as a result huge pressure was created on the surface it would cause earthquake and other kind of displacements which would cause the ocean water to move upwards because of that high waves were generated and these waves would move towards the landmass at a very high speed causing tsunamis so tsunami moved towards the landmass at a very high speed destroying port cities and towns structures buildings and other settlements if you see around the world coastal areas are densely populated because a lot of trade takes place ships can come easily for export and import so civilization exists in a much densely manner so when tsunami comes there will be a huge loss of life and property when there is a massive damage it is beyond the capacity of an individual state or government to cope with it so just be careful about this word called mitigate 
you will hear this a lot when it comes to natural disaster climate change or any kind of a natural calamity related issue so if you use this word in your writing you would get wonderful marks so the meaning of mitigate is to make less severe or harsh as it is by the calamity a lot of damage has occurred so government usually use this word called mitigate which means they'll do something really grateful but it is not going to guarantee success or it is not going to bring back the life how it was for example they can open a shelter care they can give free food they can provide few facilities for free but that is not going to help you in coping up completely 100% so that is the meaning of mitigate remember this word India has volunteered to join the International Tsunami Warning System after the December 2004 tsunami disaster. So as we learned that the problem is so huge, the damage is so huge that it is very difficult for one country's government to deal with it. Hence, you have to join hands with a lot of other countries to solve this issue. So the third type of disaster is caused by tropical cyclone. So remember this point, air always moves from high pressure to low pressure area. So tropical cyclones are intense low pressure areas. And by the name of it, you can figure out tropical. The meaning of tropical is areas between Tropic of Capricorn in the south to Tropic of Cancer in the north. So the region in between this is called tropical. It is also called equatorial region. So now let's try to understand their creation, how these tropical cyclones are formed. So remember this, tropical cyclone needs warm air and moist air as a fuel. Without this, it cannot be created. So now try to understand warmness, okay? So warmness is received from land's heat. So remember, land gets heated much faster than water. And in the tropical area that is near the equator, the sun rays are always direct. The land will be heating much faster than water. Secondly, moisture. Moisture is always found near sea area. So if you visit any beach you'll see the humidity is very high so what is humidity humidity is nothing but the amount of water vapor in the air which is called moisture so now you have understood the fuel part what is needed to create a cyclone now let's try to understand how it is created so as we have read before that air moves from high pressure to low pressure low pressure is always at warm place and remember warm place is land because land surface gets heated faster than water the high pressure would be sea area so now when these wind move towards the low pressure that is land mass area there with this fuel warm air and moist air they go through a circulation so air always moves in circular fashion and that's how cyclones are formed the width of these cyclones are usually between 500 to 1000 km. So just imagine how massive it is. And the height of it from the surface is 12 to 14 km. Just imagine how long it is. Cyclones are usually called as hurricane. We don't call it as tropical cyclone, we call it as hurricane. In India, cyclones are mostly developed in the area of Bay of Bengal and during the months of October and November near Sundarban Delta. One thing we need to understand is, as the distance increases from the sea, the force of the cyclone decreases. So remember, the fuel gets over. What are the fuel? Warm air and moist air. Of course, you will have the warm air because you're moving towards the land. But what about the moist air? You are getting away from the sea level, right? Moist air is found in sea level. Coastal areas are often struck by cyclone and at a speed of 180 km per hour. Just imagine how fast it is and what it can cause. It can naturally increase the sea level. The sea level is going to be pushed towards the coastal areas causing tsunamis or floods. Blood. So just have a look at the coastal area on the map of India and especially Sundarban Delta. And the fourth type of disaster are the floods. Floods are nothing but rise in the water level in the river channels and then spills over. It could be due to the rain or melting of snow. River bed is never straight like a gully. So at every turn, you turn, the water can spill over and cause floods. So this is the entire meaning of it. So some of the places in India which faces high floods are Assam, West Bengal and Bihar. When floods occur, they have serious consequences on the national economy and society. So a lot of our nation crops rely on water coming from rivers. And when flood occurs, they destroy crops, they damage physical infrastructure such as roads, rails, bridges and human settlement. And when water comes into the civilized area, there it becomes stagnant. And stagnant water causes a lot of diseases such as cholera, hepatitis and other waterborne diseases. So one positive thing about floods are they bring fresh layer of fertile soil. And one such crop which benefits out of it is paddy. But these are insignificant benefits in comparison to the grave losses. And the fifth type of disaster is droughts. So drought is an extended period when there is a shortage of water due to lack of rainfall. So this is the precise definition for droughts. Now in other words, it is also called evaporation. So the meaning of evaporation is, it is the process through which liquid changes into gases with the help of heat. 
I want you to look at this map and see the extreme drought affected areas Rajasthan, Gujarat and the western Aravallis. And then we go on to the severe drought prone area. This is Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and south part of Jharkhand. And the moderate drought affected areas are Haryana, Uttar Pradesh and Goa. So the consequences that we face due to drought is there will be a huge scarcity of food grains because the, if there is no water, crops cannot grow. And then we have a lot of death of cattle because cattle survive on crops or fodders due to lack of water. You don't have food for cattle and animals, so they die. And at the extreme cases, we have migration of human beings. People migrate from one place to another. Like if there is no water, then there is no point of living. Just go to the next place where there is water. So from economic point of view, migration does affect the economic condition of a particular place. And the last form of disasters are the landslides. Rapid sliding of large mass of bedrocks is called a landslide. Even though they are less damaging compared to earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, but their impact in the natural environment and national economy is no way less severe. Now some of the places which are highly unstable, they have young mountain areas like the Himalayas, Andaman and Nicobar, high rainfall regions which have steep slopes like the Western Ghats and Nilgiris and the northeastern region. These are some of the places which are very prone to landslides. Now some of the consequences of landslides are roadblocks, destruction of railway lines, channel blocking due to rock falls and then diversion of river courses. So with this we have come to an end of this chapter. It was a long chapter but very informative things are covered and a lot of it we are aware of it. So it's a quick brush up of what we know and what we need to know. I hope you found this video informative and I also hope you enjoyed it. So stay tuned for more videos in the coming year. Speaking of which, let me add a bit of sound effect. Hmm, so new year is on its way. I really hope your academic and career pursuits take a massive boost this year. I'm not going anywhere, we'll meet up here next year with new set of videos. If you enjoy watching these videos, be the awesome person who gives a thumbs up. I'll catch you guys next year. This is Amit signing off. Peace.